Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be at the first Velocity Conference in New York City. I'm Mike O'Day, Senior Director of Technical Operations for MLB Advanced Media, otherwise known as MLBAM. I run the 24 by 7 ops team that's responsible for keeping our web, mobile, and streaming environments up and running. My goal is to make sure customers have the best possible live stream experience. But as we all know, sometimes things can go from awesome to bad very quickly. For instance, if our streams start to go off the rails, I'll give Bill Zerat a call, who's on stage with me. <laughs> um, Bill is our director of multimedia systems. He makes sure the video streams we create at MLBAM can be distributed and consumed from first mile to the last. Okay. So it probably makes a little sense to give you a little bit of our history and current narrative. We frequently encounter folks who ask who we are and what we do. You guys just stream baseball, right? Okay. Many times we surprise them with the response. To make it simple, MLBAM was started in 2000 by the 30 MLB teams to run the league's internet and interactive arm. This includes running MLB.com, the 30 MLB team sites, as well as the minor league sites. As we uh, developed our product and grew as a company, we found that many folks are interested in our solutions for streaming live events to the public. Over time, our expertise in this realm evolved. We started to white label our solutions for other companies. For example, we provide live streaming to ESPN3, TBS March Madness, Row 44, and the New York Tech Meetup. That's just a few of the partners that we work with. Okay, so with that kind of awkward intro out of the way, I'm gonna hand it over to Bill, who will give you a dive into our MLB streaming experience. All right, thanks a lot, Mike, appreciate it. So yeah, I think it's best that I give everyone here the 10,000 foot view as to how we deliver live MLB streams to our customers. As Mike mentioned, there are 30 MLB teams and we need to stream to every team's production, whether they're home or away. So this satisfies a strong audience demand while rooting for their squad. And just for an example, a case, a Dodgers fan can listen to the soothing tones of Vince Scully, whether LA is playing at Chavez Ravine or visiting AT&T Park in San Francisco. Now, to make this happen, we have encoders at the ballparks and decoders at our Chelsea Market Data Center. Every encoder and decoder is connected via our MPLS network. From there, we can ingest the video into our routing infrastructure, handing baseband video into a Cisco encoder pool. You know, at this point, we are transitioning from the traditional video acquisition into the world of live streaming. At our multimedia core, as you see here, we have a provisioning system whose responsibility is to manage encoder resources, schedule start-stop times, and publish stream links. The encoders then output multiple H260, H.264 encoded bit rates. Now, most of these bit rates are RTMP streams published to Akamai in level three for flash player consumption. But at the same time, we are also leveraging those same bit rates and creating a couple more as transport streams where we're feeding that into our segmenters, and this is where HLS is fabricated. Now, let's stick with the HLS flow since we see it right here on the slide. We have our segmenters, and they're cutting the transport streams into five-second chunks. Only after a chunk is made can the segmenter make an M308. And generally, the question comes back to me, what's an M308? So the, HL, the HLS cliffs that I usually provide on this matter is that it's quite simply an index. It's an index which informs the various players where the next piece of video is referenced. It's then up to the clients to download that video, and the application needs to play those chunks back seamlessly. So let's walk it through. The transport stream chunks in the M308s are laid down to Isilon disk, served via web and caching infrastructure. Now, Level 3 and Akamai will pull that content from our origin based on client requests. All right. Everybody loves scale, and here's a bit of scale for you. Every production feed that we do, this needs to happen every five seconds for nine different bit rates that hold eight different renditions of the M308 for various playback scenarios. The quick math on that is 72 atomic updates every five seconds for each production. Now, that's a lot to expect from our file system and our CDNs, but we manage to do this every day during the baseball season, even when there are 30 teams playing concurrently on a Tuesday night. Now, Mike's going to come back here, and he's going to explain the substantial differences when we stream minor leagues. Thanks, Bill. All right, so with that in mind, we can start addressing our miners' problem as it relates to our mobile streaming app. This graph shows what the rest of the world has already been telling us, that mobile consumption has been exploding over the last four years. We were very excited to be the first sporting event to stream live video to the iPhone. We've been providing uh, HLS streams to our app at iOS app since the 2009 season. But you're also only as good as how well you can scale up to 350 devices and then also scale back down. With the miners uh, solution, we had to satisfy a product requirement that didn't have the same infrastructure resources as MLB. 
and we were obligated to serve a greater number of teams concurrently. So that was the devices slide. <laughs> okay, so here's a location uh, of our data centers and the MLB teams spread across the country. As noted previously, we acquire MLB game video by sending it over private networks to a centralized location in New York City. This involves a fairly massive broadcast and IP routing infrastructure, as well as considerable CapEx and OpEx uh, expense to support it. So now let's take a look at the miners. So let's see, here are the AAA teams, here are the AA teams, here's the Class A teams, and here are AWS regions. That's 90 teams across the country, and we didn't have the luxury of using a private network to pull individual video feeds at 25 megs a second. In fact, our outbound bandwidth can be as high as a whopping three megs a second and as low as 500K a second. That's a massive drop off from what we're used to, but we still need to provide a standardized streaming experience for our miners' subscribers. Other challenges include totally decentralized infrastructure, decentralized administration, and a fraction of resources when it came to compute and bandwidth. Yet the goal was to deliver an equivalent experience for a higher volume of games with greater concurrency. Not a problem. It's actually Bill's problem, and I'm gonna let him tell you how we dealt with it. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot, Mike, really appreciate that. Um, everybody on the team helps out with that. All right, let's run through the hardware and the services layer, and then we'll get into the, some of that high-level architecture that allows us to solve this really thorny problem. Let's start at the ballparks. A miner's team has an inlet encoder, and it's being fed video from a bunch of cameras. Now, that video needs to go somewhere, right? So we thought maybe we'll bring it back to our East Coast data center, but I don't know. I mean, do you really want to like, you know, ship the bits from the West Coast back to the East Coast and then have a fan consume back on the West Coast? I don't know. It seems kind of silly, especially for a streaming product. So we thought about this, and we thought about building out an AWS infrastructure that has geographic diversity using the WOWS and media servers, our transcoder, VOD archiver, and relay server. In essence, it's a streaming Swiss Army knife. From there, we fan out the two RTMP streams that are relayed to Akamai, hitting ingest servers that are geographically appropriate. Now, there's a little fuzz in this, but generally speaking, ballparks east of the Mississippi, well, they're going to relay from Virginia, while ballparks west of the Mississippi, they're coming from Oregon. In the HLS portion, that's sourced by a single feed and transcode to a low, medium, and high bit rate. And these variants account for the ability to adapt up and down without buffering. All of the HLS streams are fronted by CDN level three, which, treat, which, which we treat generally as just a giant reverse proxy. All right, we got through that. Now let's go through what provisioning does. It's gonna coordinate the streaming resources and it's gonna schedule the events based on like some RESTful endpoints that it's gonna hit. All of this, as you can see here, is done for just one game. And we need to reproduce the solution 45 times during the day, sometimes all concurrently, while ensuring resiliency to any failure. All right. Well, to that end, we run in two AWS regions and have our availability zone structured in N plus one configuration. Now, thankfully, we haven't had any issues with our availability zones. But, you know, as we all know, knocking on wood only gets you so far, right? So we have monitoring, and it's a blend of Nagios and homebrew tools. We can detect a stream, host, or systemic problem in availability zone, essentially planning for a failure at any, every level there. The rare times that we did experience issues, we had provisioning drain, drain the troubled hosts of all the active streams. We still had the full ability to reprovision every game using the remaining hosts in the availability zones for both east and west regions. Encoders can be logged into remotely and published directly to the CDN if AWS ever suffered a complete and total meltdown. Now, thankfully, we haven't had to do that, but it is in our back pocket. And uh, we, can all, we, we can say this, too. We've always been able to recover from a stream without having any type of customer service complaints. So that's really important for our operations crew. And they're completely hands-on, and they're making these changes as part of a documented procedure, and that allows me to sleep at night during those late West Coast games. So again, what could possibly go wrong, right? We did our due diligence. We explained our plan to our bosses, Wowza and Amazon. And after a couple of sideways glances, we heard some words of encouragement, such as good luck or best get started, which we generally tra translated as don't face plan on opening day. All right. Now we're gonna take turns explaining some of the operational hazards making live video scalable and consistent. Mike has a few words about cache efficiency here as it relates to HLS. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so as we began developing our HLS architecture, we knew that we needed to solve the problem of video players continuously requesting freshly minted video and M3U8s while maintaining the highest level of cache efficiency. To be honest, uh, at first, tuning cache was a bit of a dark art. 
We didn't have proper client-side logging to understand when we hit the caching sweet spot as client requests made their way through the CDN back to origin. Make your TTLs too high, and you risk stalling playback, having sporadic stream switching, and download performance. Make your TTLs too low, and then you're generating more traffic and stressing your delivery. Let me give you some perspective uh, as to how we tune our cache. During a VOD event, we expect to be in the upper 90s. For live events, we expect to be at 99% efficiency. With a full slate of MLB game streaming, that number will climb to 99.98%. And we make sure our local video cache is sized to hold an entire day's worth of content, so uh, requests don't come back and hit our local file system. From our perspective, if we see under 90% cache efficiency in our delivery, we consider it very problematic and begin immediate triage. So what does it mean to lower your cache efficiency? From our perspective, you have more clients that are pulling back from the origin instead of the CDN edge. You're adding not only latency, but additional origin egress traffic, and that means you're gonna pay more in bandwidth and streaming will absolutely suffer. So one day early in the minor season, as we were kind of getting going with this, we noticed some cache efficiency alerts popping up. This graph shows you where the cache efficiency was hurting pretty badly due to CDN misconfiguration. As you can see, it was, it was bad. Uh, we aimed to remedy the condition and uh, we got it fixed and customers didn't even notice a problem, which is a total win. Uh, cache efficiency absolutely matters, especially in the mobile world. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Bill for one of my personal favorite stories, which is hot dog fail. And he's gonna walk you through this. I think it's everyone's favorite story. Yeah. Back Ours, at the ranch, definitely. yeah. <laughs> But uh, we're hoping to make it, obviously, your favorite story as well that you can have um, regarding baseball here. So hot dogs, beers, and rainy days make video very sad sometimes. And as you can imagine, there are the usual streaming headaches you would have for any remote systems environment. For instance, our MLBAM operators need to coordinate with over 90 unique remote technical staffs. Now, random firewall rules get applied, IP addresses change, and sometimes encoders are almost set up in a data center that was constructed as an outdoor tent. Now, it really did happen, but uh, these problems we can sort through really quickly, obviously. But one of the best stories that we have to share is what we've called the hot dog fail story. And this did take a little more time to figure out. So here's what was happening. At one ballpark, we kept seeing video buffering events on the inlet. And initially, we thought this was pretty random since we couldn't reproduce in testing when there wasn't any game action. And generally, you're going to take a look at the CDN ingest and everything passed at that, at that portion of the data flow. So, since we were in the pre-Splunk and even uh, the pre wowsy year, for that matter, we started to dig into the problem by creatively enough opening up a spreadsheet and just documenting the issue when it happened. Um, after a while, we began noticing some trends. So we generally saw the buffering happening around the seventh or eighth inning. Another interesting data point was that it happened during storm events, which coincided with the outages. So we called the remote uh, stadium staff, and we began poking around, asking some questions like, how could this possibly affect video quality? Well. Initially, stadium staff was a bit reticent, and they just didn't say anything really could correlate with those events. Until one day, someone was looking through the receipts, and they noticed there a giant surge in hot dog and beer sales during rain delays and the seventh inning stretch. OK, well, that's interesting, but so what? How does this still affect our video quality? Well, the answer, as it turned out, came to us in the form of a question. Could the new point of sale system used for concessions affect the video if it was configured here to share the same outbound route as the video stream? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, Maybe. just a little. <laughs> just, just a touch. So that, that pretty much concludes the fail portion of our talk. <laughs> but uh, we're, Mike's going to get back up here, and he's going to tell us whether this was success yeah. or not. All right, thanks. Hot dog fail. Uh, so let's talk about whether the, or, or not this was a success, seen as a success by the organization. Uh, it absolutely was. For one, we now have HLS delivery for the miners while maintaining RTMP streams for desktop clients. From April to September of this year, we stream roughly 5,000 games, which comprise of 15,000 HLS streams, 5,000 RTMP streams. Our video operations staff could now reliably transition one game from live to VOD and highlights in 30 minutes. The year before, that took seven hours per game. My ops team now has performance metrics and proactive monitoring of the entire uh, streaming environment end to end. And bottom line, the entire build out and operation costs came in under budget. The app views grew 680% year over year, and we grew revenue for the product by 20% year over year. But most importantly, we gave hardcore baseball fans the ability to watch their favorite teams from class A's up to the majors. Thanks, Velocity. Uh, it was a pleasure. It's great to be here. And uh, we're absolutely hiring. <laughs>